Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Purdy Insurance. Visit Purdy Insurance on Market Street in Sunbury or visit online at purdyinsurance.com. John Sobers, Center Daily Times, does a great job, is on the line with us. John, welcome back. Great to have you with us. I appreciate the kind words, Steve. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, always enjoy it. Thanks. Uh, so, what were you? What was the thought process on your part going into the game, and then what was the thought process as you watched it play out? Yeah. So going in, it, it felt like a pivot point for the program, right? Uh, I wrote after the uh, the Michigan game that you know that that kind of revealed uh, about a lot about Penn State football, right? That they just kind of weren't on that level yet. Um, or the level that I think a lot of people want them to be on, um, and that this was going to be Minnesota was going to dictate whether you know they were on the kind of on the right track or not, right? Because you can lose at Michigan like that and then bounce back against Minnesota and still be on the right track, but you can't let that loss turn into two, especially with Ohio State potentially turning into the three pretty quickly, which is as everyone knows has been a problem for the program in the last few years. One turns into two, turns into three and. They didn't let that happen, right? And I will say, you know, watching the game, it kind of seemed like that was going to happen again, right? You, they start the game the way they did. Sean Clifford throws the interception. Um, it, it seemed like it was like, uh oh, you know, is this is this happening again? I'm sure there are fans that felt that way too. I mean, I, I know there were, and you could hear the, the you know, the the reaction in the stadium. <laughs> uh, but it was. I it noticed served, it. <laughs> well, yeah, it was. It, it served as a pivot point, though, and it served as a pivot point in the positive direction, right? Like the way it ended, I don't know that anyone on the field could have played much better. Uh, you know, I do the my weekly good, bad, ugly column, and most of the bad was focused around Minnesota, and the ugly was focused on stuff that happened at the start of the game, right? Not stuff that that carried mm-hmm. throughout. So it was it was genuinely a really impressive performance given what had happened the week prior. Uh- the tight ends got involved to the point of seven catches for 118 yards and two touchdowns, John. What did that kind of production actually do to open up the running game? Yeah, it was enormous because it, it, it made uh, Minnesota's defense focus on the deep third of the field, right, the deep middle of the field, the middle third of the field in general. Um, and, and those linebackers kind of had to be weary of, of what was happening, and it, it allowed uh, Penn State to sort of just attack the ground game because maybe the linebacker takes a step back after the snap. Uh, maybe their their mind is a little too focused on, okay, where's Theo Johnson, where's Brenton Strange, where's Tyler Warren? Um, and that kind of allowed those those running backs to take advantage of the space they were given. Credit to, to Katron Allen and Nick Singleton. They were both really, really good in this game. Uh, the offensive line was really good in this game from a run-blocking and pass-blocking perspective. I think this is probably, you know, I haven't done a comparative analysis or anything, but I think this is probably their best uh, performance of the season. Uh, off the top of my head, and, and I think a lot of that is because it kind of freed the middle of the field, and and you know that's where Catron Allen especially thrives, and he was able to get going on the ground there. We know that Singleton can be the home run hitter. It's been evidence over and over again, including a couple of times, and one on a screen pass on Saturday night. When you watch Allen, though, what do you think his patience means to how a ground game goes? Oh, it's everything. It's everything this game, right? It's the patience and the contact balance. Uh, he is sort of always looking for the hole, but he's not stopping, right? You see a lot of times there are, you know, guys looking to bounce everything outside or there are guys that kind of lose their momentum. He keeps his feet moving while he's looking for the hole in the defense. Sometimes it doesn't come and he only gets, you know, one or two yards. Sometimes it does and he turns it into 13-14. And he even does it really at the second level of the defense, right? Like he hits the hole and then if there's more sort of chaos in front of him, he sorts through it mentally and figures out where he needs to go and and he hits that second hole too. So, his, his patience, his vision, his contact balance, everything about his game is kind of typical three-down back that can play at an elite level. And, and you know, he's doing it at the highest level right now. And like I said, that contact balance especially, you can't, you can't arm tackle him. Uh, you, you can't sort of hit him and hope he's going to go down. You have to wrap and bring him down. Otherwise, he's just going to keep on going because, you know, when you hit him once and he's just going to keep his feet moving and stay up. Everyone saw what Mi- Michigan did with its ground game with – Corum and Edwards and that offensive line. So what did you see from Penn State's defense in this effort against another truly terrific back in Mo Ibrahim? 
Yeah, Ibrahim is, is one of the best in the country. And I think, honestly, part of uh, Michigan's advantage is they at least had the threat of the passing game. With no Tanner Morgan, Minnesota didn't have that as much. But it also seemed like Penn State was just more consistent. Uh, they were more gap responsible. Jair Brown talked about that a lot after the game, about how the team was gap responsible. And, you know, on rewatch, you can see it. Guys aren't out of, out of place. Um, the linebackers are where they need to be. And, and honestly, I think starting Abdul Carter and getting him as many snaps as, as Penn State did was enormous, too, because it, it put you know their three best linebackers on the field, or three of their four, depending on how you feel about Kobe King and Tyler Elson. But those are the mm-hmm. top four guys, those three and Curtis Jacobs. And so you want three of those four on the field as much as you can. And as James Franklin said after the game, Penn State was able to play out of base more uh, because Minnesota wanted to run the ball so much. And, and being able to do that, getting three linebackers on the field, not having to worry as much about the passing game uh, really helped them out. Although, you know, from what I've seen, I think Abdul Carter can help in the passing game too. There will inevitably be more mistakes there. Uh, but right now I'd say he's probably the, the team's second best linebacker and the team should try to get him on the field as much as it can. But but his, his play made all the difference and his ability to just be on the field made all the difference for them. Which gets us to uh, Curtis Jacobs. 14 tackles in the game and especially a lot early. Uh, your thoughts on seeing him now at that Sam uh, field linebacker spot? He's just phenomenal, right? Like, he is he is consistently in the right place at the right time, and he's doing that, and he's playing at that high level uh, with that kind of intelligence while also being, you know, one of the best linebackers uh, athletically on the team. He is flying all over the field. Uh, he this, this doesn't, you know, get brought up as much with him because, you know, the tackle is uh, rolling the day, and, it, and it's easier to see that in the box. But, like, his coverage is also phenomenal. He's not losing guys. He's such a good athlete. He played safety in high school so he can run and turn and run with guys, uh, and he's he's done that time and time again. Didn't have to as much on Saturday, but to me it was really just a continuation of what he's been all year, and that's you know an elite linebacker, like the kind of guy that's going to play for a long time in the NFL. Uh, he's unbelievable athlete, uh, unbelievable instincts, and you can tell he's playing more free and, and not thinking as much as he did early in his career. And you know he even said time and time again that that was part of the problem for him that he was he was thinking too much he wasn't allowing himself to play freely and now he's doing that and he's doing it as well as he possibly could last couple of years john we watched jaquan uh, Jaquan brisker play in that safety spot guy that played next to him last year and now he is the guy back there is jair brown what are you seeing in him uh one of the most instinctual players in the country uh, that that uh, interception he had on the pump and go that Minnesota ran, they, that that play is designed to get him to take one false step. He doesn't even have to you know run in the direction they want him to. He needs to take one false step, and they're going to have their guy running running free down the sideline. But he didn't. He held firm. He knew what was coming, and he stood there. And you know it was it was a bit of a duck, but he he caught it, and he still got to catch him. And he was there because uh, he made the right decision, he made the right read, and because he's that high IQ of a player too, that he's you know he's seemingly always around the ball and, and I know some people think that's kind of luck uh, right you see in the NFL some like Minka Fitzpatrick is just kind of always around the ball yes. yeah your Brown has that same quality that same sort of intuition to know where he needs to be to know where the quarterback's going to know what's happening before the play has happened because he put so much work in with the film um, you know he is he's everything you want in a safety he, he might get other than maybe he's not an elite level athlete he's still a good athlete uh, you know he's probably not going to run like 4-3 or anything like that at the combine but Again, another guy that's going to play a long time in the NFL. I've, you know, you talk to people, uh, you know, that, that do the scouting and everything like that in the NFL, and, and they gush about him because you can see the instincts, you can see the IQ, you can see the willingness to sort of play over however he needs to. He didn't drop into the box as much this game, but that's something he's done all year too to help against the run. Uh, he is, you know, one of I, I would I would say he is the best player on the defense, and, and I don't, you know, I don't know that there are many safeties better in the entire in the entire country. It looks like the Big Ten, John, is going to keep divisions uh, next season in 2023 and then reconfigure whatever model they want when USC and UCLA get in in 24. Any thought at all on your part about keeping divisions at least one more year? Yeah, I just, I just kind of don't get it, right? <laughs> like the change is going to happen. It seems pretty clear, right, that USC and UCLA are going to get in the Big Ten and they're going to make the change. And they're either going to go no divisions or reconfigure divisions. I would advocate for no divisions. I think that's how you get your two best teams playing and, and kind of don't end up with blowouts in the Big Ten title game because – I mean, Minnesota looked like it was going to be one of the best teams in the Big Ten West, and Penn State, which, you know, right now is definitely a step below Michigan and probably a step below Ohio State, too, based on what we've seen this year. You know, 
just beat them up on Saturday. Uh, you know, you still have Illinois, who I think is a, an, an elite defense, but there just isn't a lot of talent right now out west. And I don't know if there's a reason to believe that, you know, there is a team in the west more deserving of a Big Ten title game bid than than Michigan, than Penn State, right, than these teams in the east. Uh, that maybe it's their second crack at Ohio State, but, I, I mean, from an outside perspective, I'd rather watch that than than watch you know what will presumably be a blowout win for Ohio State or Michigan or whoever. Um, you know, I just like I said, it feels inevitable that that they're going to go no divisions in all likelihood. So I don't know why you, you don't just make the shift now and uh, you know increase your brand right from from a college football perspective because I know we're going to get to that championship Saturday, the conference championship Saturday, and the Big Ten title game probably won't won't be one of those marquee matchups just because it's. It's going to be one of the teams that's the elite of the elite and a good team that they're facing, but not a great team. And and that's just, it's a tough sell. John, how often have you seen Ohio State play this season? And when you have seen them, what have been your thoughts? Uh, Too much. I watch way too much college football in general uh, during the week. I do it a lot. I've I've already watched, uh, I watched the Iowa game live on Saturday, and I'll I'll rewatch that again this week at some point. But I've seen them play uh, too much so far this year. Uh, this was something I said prior to the season, uh, and so it may seem like I'm a bandwagon jumper here, but I have friends who can uh, confirm this opinion at the time, but I, I thought going into the year that Marvin Harrison Jr. was going to be the best receiver in the country, and mm-hmm. right now I think he looks like it. I think he's an absolute monster on the outside. He is like He has Hall of Fame upside in the NFL. He is that good. He's an unbelievable athlete, has unbelievable size at six foot three. You can tell he gets some of the, the, the technician skills as a receiver from his dad. Uh, just just an absolute force on the outside. All of their wide receivers are really good. Uh, I'll be interested to see if Jackson Smith and Jigba plays. He's been dealing with a hamstring injury all season. But they've got a great offense. C.J. Stroud has been up and down at times, but I like what I see for the most part from him. Really, really good at getting the ball to his playmakers and letting them go to work. Their ground game, Travion Henderson's really good. Uh, their, their their tackles are good, but you know can be susceptible to to elite pass rushers. I think Chop Robinson's status for Saturday is going to be really important for Penn State. Uh, you know, I'm sure we'll ask about his status tomorrow or Wednesday and get an update there. Uh, but it is it is imperative that Penn State has its, pa- its best pass rushers on the field for this game because Ohio State is going to try to air it out. Um, and you need to be able to get to the quarterback. Uh, fortunately for Penn State, they also have some of the best corners in the country. Uh, I'm a, a big Kalen King uh, believer. Mm-hmm. I, I think he is on Joey Porter Jr.'s level. Uh, those two guys, you can put them on an island and trust them against the best in the country, which is a good thing for Penn State because this week they're going to be going up against the best in the country. Uh, defensively, uh, Ohio State really athletic, really good off the edge with Zach Harrison. Uh, you can beat them a little bit with the run. Uh, I think Penn State's going to need to do that, and they're going to need to, you know, try and find some explosive plays because Ohio State will surely find theirs. But this is, to me, this is going to come down to, to forcing turnovers for Penn State's defense and, and Penn State's offense finding those explosive plays. John, always a pleasure. Great work as always. Appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you on Saturday. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate it. See you Saturday.